Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for tuning in. This is my first time Twitch streaming, uh, and I'm super excited about doing this. I mean, um, you know, it's it's a big day for me. Uh, you know, uh, it's 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 very cool to finally be streaming on Twitch. Um, uh, my name is David Street, and I work for the um, um, BMI LA office as the associate director of creative. Um, I was speaking with with Beat of the Week recently because we were talking about potential ways we could. We could partner to throw like a kind of like a cool, helpful event um, that kind of uh, disseminated a bunch of cool information about the music business, and uh, and here we are. Um, so this is the BMI and Beat of the Week industry showcase, um, and I am the guest speaker today. I'm super honored to be here. Shout out to, to Beat of the Week for for partnering with BMI to, to set this up. Um, so in the first part of this live stream, I'm going to go over some royalty basics, um, help explain. Um, a little bit about kind of the larger world in which BMI operates, and then later, um, you know, I'll go into some uh, uh, more specifics on, on working with BMI, best practices, common misconceptions, um, and then at the end of that, we can go through any questions that you guys have through the chat. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the showcase, um, I might not be able to see the chat as I'm kind of going through my whole spiel, so just write them down, and hopefully maybe we can save the questions for the end, and then at the end of this whole thing, we can go through um, you know, the, uh, the, the questions from the chat function and I can answer uh, a few questions. Um, so let's get started on a kind of larger explanation of the music business and, um, how BMI kind of like fits into it. Um, so, you know, most people I know get into the music business because they love music, right? Um, they love writing music, they love performing music, they love playing music. Um, and obviously like, you know, making music is like really hard, right? A lot goes into making music, as I'm sure all, all of you know, you know, you spend all this time um, making great music, learning like music theory and uh, DAWs and like synthesizers and drums and guitars. Um, and then when you finally are, you know, have something that's, that's really great that you want to release, you release it and the music starts generating money in the form of royalties. And most people don't know what royalties are being generated, how to collect the money properly. Um, and this, this honestly like breaks my heart because, um, I want all creators out there to receive all of the money that they deserve and it's confusing. Um, so hopefully this presentation kind of clears a little bit of that, that, up. I'm going to kind of go off, off the cuff. I have some notes here. Um, but the first thing to understand is that there are a bunch of different types of royalties you can collect out there. So we kind of need to back up a little bit to kind of explain all of them. So um, I'll start with the basics for understanding um, this world. Um, so how do you own music and how do you make um, money off of music, right? These sound like super simple questions, but the answers are pretty complex when you think about it. So the first thing um, I want to look into is how we own music, okay? Um, so the world has basically decided that there's two parts of a piece of music that you can own, um, or, uh, I guess two copyrights if you want to get super, super legal about it. Um, hey, uh, Natalie, what's going on? Thank you for joining. So, so we're talking about pieces of, of music that you can own. So there's two main parts of a piece of music that you can own. Um, the first one is called the composition and that's, uh, basically like lyrics, melody, whatever would fit on sheet music. Um, uh, it, that's the, it's kind of like the underlying songs, okay? So that's the composition, that's the first part that you can own. And the second part of piece of music that you can own is called the master. Um, it's also called the sound recording, the interchangeable. Um, so this is the actual recording of that song, okay? So um, let me unpack that for a second, because this can be confusing to some people. So if I write a song, right? Um, like I write the lyrics, the melody, the, I play the chords on piano, let's say, and then I play it for my friend and my friend's like, I want to record it. My friend um, records all the vocals on his computer. He um, figures out what instruments he wants in the background, does all the backing music for it, but using my chords and melodies that I wrote, right? Um, and he produces this whole sound recording of my song. Okay, well, he's going to own the master, the sound recording, because he made that. And I am going to own... Um, the uh, the composition since I wrote the song, okay? So owning one doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna own the other, but it's obviously possible to own both. If you write the song and you record it yourself, 
you're going to own both of these things. But there are two completely different copyrights, and the music business is kind of divided between these two things, right? So um, now that we kind of have that down, um, let me go into some roles related to the composition and the master, just to kind of clarify what certain people do and don't do. So the creator of a composition of a song is called a songwriter. And I know that that sounds like super basic, um, but bear with me here. The reason why I'm, I mention this is because the word songwriter is kind of like an umbrella term. So um, anybody who help, helps to create a song is a songwriter. Um, so uh, for example, like um, a producer, um, if a producer is writing melodies in the background, right, and they're producing some of the background music, then the producer is a songwriter. If someone's writing lyrics, but they're not really writing any of the melodies or anything, while well, they're still writing the lyrics, that's still part of the song, so they also are a songwriter. So the, the word songwriter kind of means all of those things, right? Um, anybody who helps to, to create the song is a songwriter. Um, the owner of a composition is called a publisher. And people get, like, uh, so, so confused uh, <laughs> with the word publisher. And all, literally all it means is owner of a composition. Um, so, um, you know, if you own your own music, like you write a song and by default you're going to own the song that you just created, well then you are the publisher of that song because you're the owner. Um, so, you know, I hear this word used incorrectly like all the time. Um, I, I hear people say like, oh, I'm, I'm publishing that song next week. And what they mean to me is that they're releasing the song next week. Um, that's not what the word publishing means, right? Um, if you're publishing a song, it just means that you own that song at that period of time. It doesn't mean that you're releasing it. It doesn't mean that you're doing anything else. Um, so that's, that's what songwriter and publisher are, right? Songwriter is creator of the song. Publisher is owner of the song. And most, most of you probably listening right now um, are going to be both, right? You're going to be a songwriter who writes songs and you're going to own your own song. So you're also the publisher. Um, so now we're going to go to the master. Um, and, uh, oh, thank you, uh, Alexis, appreciate that. I'm trying to explain this stuff in a simple way because it's, for whatever reason, like really tough to find clear explanations of a lot of this stuff online. So hopefully this can, can help all of you. Um, so um, for the master, the creator of a master or a sound recording is typically like the artist or the performers because they're the ones actually recording the music, right? Um, uh, and, and playing on the recording and, and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and the owner of a master or a sound recording, historically, this is a record label. This is what record labels get to own. Um, because, you know, just for some history, if we were to go back in like the 70s, let's say, um, it was really hard to put out a record back then um, because you, you couldn't just record it on a computer at home because computers didn't exist. So you had to go in a super expensive, um, uh, you know, um, studio, you had to get mixing engineers, mastering engineers, you had to work with a distribution company to print all your vinyl and manufacture them and then ship them across the country or across the world to different record shops. So that was really hard to do and it was really expensive and it took a lot of expertise. So back in the 70s, the only real feasible way to do that was to go through a record label. And so what the record label got in return was they got to own your sound recordings, right? So Nowadays, if you're just releasing music on your own um, and you're basically, um, you know, signing up to a digital distributor and you're just putting your music on all the platforms, well, you, in a sense, are the record label. Um, and so you're going to own your own master, right? Um, so that's kind of how that all works. Um, composition, master, all the roles. Um, so publishers don't really deal with sound recordings. They don't own all that. And... Record labels typically don't own compositions. They only own the sound recording, right? So that's kind of that divide I'm talking about. Yeah, and as Trey said in the comments, if you write and record everything, you're going to own all of it, right? Which is, which is awesome. So now that we kind of understand how to own music and some of these like roles defined with it, um, let's talk about some of the ways that you can make money. So this is like the cool stuff. So as I said before, um, there's many different types of royalties out there, right? When I first heard about music royalties, I thought that there was just like one music royalty. Uh, totally not true. There are many different types of royalties out there. So um, some are uh, paid uh, for the composition, 
to songwriters and publishers, and then some are paid to the master to artists and labels. Um, and it, every royalty kind of fits typically in one of those boxes. Um, so um, why are there so many different types of royalties out there? Why does it have to be so complicated? I promise it's not to confuse you um, and make you give up. <laughs> it's uh, The reason why most of these exist is because there's different ways that music can be used. And so in the copyright law, it kind of defines all these different ways that music can be used. And then there's a different royalty for each of those ways. So like if music is played out loud, there's royalty for that. If music is duplicated on like a record or CD, there's a royalty for that. If a royalty or um, if your song is attached to a moving picture, there's a royalty for that. So um, there's different royalties for all the different ways that music can be used. And if a business is using music in multiple ways, they're going to pay multiple types of royalties. So it's possible that, um, you know, a stream on Spotify, um, and in this case, a, a stream on Spotify actually pays you three different royalty streams. Okay, so this is why it starts to get complex and why people end up missing some of the money that they're owed. So unfortunately, um, you know, I don't have time in this event to go through every single royalty um, because uh, we have limited time um, and I'm only one guy and I'm going to be talking for a while on here. But uh, I highly recommend you guys doing some independent research now that you kind of know this um, and you can search something... Um, you know, to the effect of like um, different types of royalties owed to musicians or something like that. Um, and you can kind of, there's some great articles that I've seen online. You can get like a roadmap for like, here's all the different royalties, who they pay, um, who pays that, like what organization can you sign up to collect those or how do you collect them? Um, and if you want to get a little bit more in depth, there's a couple of like really great books out there. Um, I have a few of them. Um, a classic one is Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business by Donald Passman. It's on like it's like 10th edition. Super great resource. Um, Donald is like, um, he, I think he's uh, Taylor Swift's attorney and like he, he's great. And he explains things in a really simple way. So that's a great one. Another good one is um, by Ari Herstan. It's, it's a book called How to Make It in the New Music Business. Um, and he goes through like a ton of different topics, not only royalty collection, but also um, how to market yourself online and stuff like that. Um, great guy and a great book. I, um, I think they're about to release their second edition or they already have. So check that one out. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so those are some good resources, but for this live stream, um, we're going to talk, um, specifically about the, the royalty that, that BMI pays. Um, and, uh, I see some of your questions there. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more of that as we continue, um, further on. And I'm going to explain kind of uh, BMI and ASCAP now. Sound exchange is a whole other topic. Uh, um, sound exchange is one of those that pays royalties for the master and not for the composition. Okay, so um, they pay a completely different royalty stream because um, there's many different royalties out there. Um, so, uh, anyways, um, let's talk about the specific royalty that BMI pays um, and kind of focus in a little bit more on that. Um, so. Basically, um, uh, BMI pays a royalty for the composition, for the song, and we pay songwriters and publishers, so we pay creators of songs and owners of songs, um, and we pay a royalty called performance royalties. Um, so remember before I said that there's a different royalty for each type of way that music is used. So this royalty is paid um, when a composition is played out loud by a business in some capacity, as part of their business. So basically what that means is if there's a business playing your song out loud, then um, according to federal copyright law, um, if they want to play your music out loud, they, um, you basically, as the owner, need to grant them permission. Okay. So uh, let me just get into some sp examples because this might be a little confusing. So um, radio stations, right? If a radio station is playing your song out loud, on their radio station, then it's kind of part of their business, right? Um, and so uh, they would then owe you performance royalties if they played your song. Um, so um, some other uh, uh, businesses that play music out loud that could pay performance royalties would be like uh, TV networks, um, venues, uh, sports arenas, right? Because if your music is playing on TV, um, if, you're, if you're playing in um, venues, obviously, if someone's playing your music at a show, um, sports arenas, concerts, theme parks, um, Trey, uh, Forever 21, 
Exactly right. Like, like restaurants, bars, retail stores, right? If your music is playing in the background, that's part of their business, right? So um, as a songwriter writing those songs, um, the, the way that you get compensated for that is performance royalties. Um, so obviously, if you're like a writer or a publisher, it's extremely difficult to collect these royalties on your own, right? Like, how would you know which businesses around the world are um, performing? Um, oh, I see uh, Alexis, a uh, grocery store. Yes, that counts. Uh, anyone playing music out loud is part of their business, right? If you're just playing music in your car, your car isn't a business, unless I guess unless you're like in Lyft or something. But uh, but your car isn't a business, right? So um, so you could or you know if you're playing something on TV in your house, that's not a business. But um, if you're at the grocery store, that's a business, and they're playing music in the background, so that counts. Um, okay, so if you're a writer or a publisher and you're trying to collect these on your own, then how would you know which businesses around the world are performing your music, right? How do you know how many times they're performing your music? How much? Um, you know, you can invoice them for, um, how to get a hold of them. And if you're a business, like you probably don't want to be dealing with like millions of songwriters asking to be paid because they own 5% of the song that you played on Tuesday. Right. So there needs to be, um, some type of middleman. Um, uh, and that's basically what, what BMI is. Um, we are, um, the, basically the bridge between songwriters and publishers and the businesses playing their songs. Um, and that said, everything that we do is for the benefit of our songwriters, composers, and music publishers. Um, you know, we, we kind of work on their behalf to um, collect and distribute these performance royalties. Um, so basically, on your behalf, um, we contact the businesses, we negotiate um, license fees, um, we collect um, all the license fees and all the data um, as to what they're playing, um, we divide and distribute these fees in the form of royalties to all the writers and publishers who have signed up for us and registered their music with us. Um, and that's kind of what we do. Um, there's a few things that came in. Uh, yeah, so YouTube is a business using music. So YouTube pays performance royalties for their streams as well, right? This counts as for digital and for real stores, any business using, who's playing music out loud. The playing out loud is kind of the key, the key part there. Um, so a um, few quick facts um, about performance rights organizations now that we kind of understand the concept. So um, we are not the only one in the U.S., okay? We are not the only performing rights organization that does this. We have um, competitors within the U.S., um, and these are ASCAP, CSAC, GMR. Um, so we all basically do the same thing. Um, and uh, other countries have their own performance rights organizations too. Um, so, you know... Uh, Germany will have GEMA, or the UK will have PRS, or Japan will have Jazz Rack. It's all these weird acronyms, uh, but but some some of the logos are really cool. Um, so every country kind of has their own, and we all work together um, for the most part. Um, so um, uh, another thing to, to note is that you know uh, BMI operates on a nonprofit making basis. Okay, um, so we're not here to make money. We're we're really serving our songwriters and our, our music publishers. Um, and uh, roughly 90 cents of every dollar that we bring in for licenses, licensing fees goes back out to the songwriters and the publishers in the form of royalties. So we're always trying to negotiate the, the, you know, um, the best uh, agreements for our songwriters, and we're always trying to pay out as much as possible um, because we're here to serve you guys. You know? um, so um, now that we've uh, covered some basics of the music business um, and we've gotten a little bit into, you know, what BMI does and why it exists and how it fits into everything, um, we can start to talk about, you know, the specifics um, of how to, how to work with, with BMI. Um, wait, hold on. I see that we have some questions here. Um, uh, what if you have a lease on the B with a producer and the songs on YouTube? And so leases, you know, it's a very, really vague term. Like I don't, we can get into that towards the end. I'll save that question for the end. Um, and then, uh, Jocelyn, um, with, with performance, that's actually a really good point. I wanted to find the word performance. Um, cause when people, sometimes when people hear like performance royalties, they think that it has to be performed live or something like a literal performance. Um, the definition for performance in this case is really just anytime your music is being played out loud. So it can be performed live by a band. It could be played, um, from a CD, like over speakers, like, played over the radio, anytime that the music is just playing out loud, like your song is being broadcast out loud, 
um, that counts as a performance. Um, so, um, okay, so uh, let's go into the specifics of BMI. So when BMI pays royalties, um, we, defy, we divide all the royalties that we get from these businesses in half, okay? So half go to the songwriters and the other half goes to the publishers. Um, that being said, um, there's two different types of accounts that you can sign up for at BMI. Um, you can sign up for songwriter accounts, which collect the songwriting shares, um, and you can sign up for, for publishing accounts, um, which collect the publishing shares. So um, songwriter accounts are free. Um, publishing accounts cost money. It's like a one-time fee. Um, so if you want to um, uh, sign up for the songwriter account, but let's say you don't want to sign up for the publishing account because it costs money, um, that's totally fine. Um, we'll actually allow you to collect all of your writer and publishing shares that, you, that you're owed through your free songwriter account. Okay? So you technically don't need to sign up as a publisher if you don't want to, but you know, if you're serious about making music, you want to do this for a living, we highly recommend that you set up a publishing account in addition to your songwriter account um, eventually. Um, because uh, there, there's many different reasons, but um, I'll just say that we, we highly recommend doing it. But if you if you don't and you want to collect most of what you're owed for free through your, your your free songwriter account, you have that option, which I think is really cool because not every performance rights organization um, offers that. So once you sign up, you should uh, register your works with us your, or your songs. Works is just kind of another word for composition or song. Um, and this is basically telling us um, what songs you've released, what songs might be being played out loud um, by businesses, right? So um, that way we know, uh, you know what you've released, what you own, and we know what to pay you for. Um, and the registration process is basically you logging into your online account once you've signed up, and then you, you um, go through a step-by-step -step, uh, process where you basically, for each song individually, you tell us all the metadata. Um, and this is kind of like uh, song title, uh, artist name, um, who the songwriters and publishers are, uh, what their account info is so that we know, you know, what accounts to pay, um, what the ownership percentages are, so how much everybody owns, um, you know, how much everybody wrote. Um, you don't need to send us music files or lyrics um, or any of that info. Um, uh, which is which is interesting. It's it's really only the metadata because we're just cross-referencing it with the data that we get from businesses. Um, so um, so yeah, we don't need any of that other music files or lyrics or any of that stuff. Um, uh, I see Jocelyn has a few questions. Let me just finish this point and then I'll get to that. Um, so um, if you do have questions, kind of more in depth on the registration process, because um, sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. I'll be honest. Um, uh, our admin team um, actually uploaded this amazing tutorial video, which is a step-by-step -step video uh, coming straight from them, um, and it's on our, our BMI YouTube page. Um, so I highly recommend if you just go to the BMI YouTube channel and you go to the videos, you can find it, um, and it literally is a step-by-step -step process of walking you through how to register each song um, to make sure that you get paid properly. Um, so um, definitely check that out. Um, so, okay, um, does it interfere with the process of copywriting your music? Okay, this is a, something that we often get confused with at BMI. Um, people think that when you register your songs at BMI, you're actually copywriting your music, and that's not true. Um, we're not technically copywriting anything here. Um, all we're doing is paying this, these performance royalties. So we're, we're just one cog in a, in a much bigger machine. Um, so uh, legally, what the law says, is that as soon as you express an idea in a tangible form, um, uh, then you've officially copywritten your material. And this isn't just for music, this is really for like anything, like, like writing a novel or uh, taking a picture. Um, so um, for example, if you write your song down on a piece of paper, you have expressed that idea in a tangible way and you've automatically copywritten your material as soon as you wrote it down on a piece of paper. Um, if you sing the song and record it on your computer, then you've expressed it in a tangible way because now there's a, a physical file um, with your song on it. Um, that being said, sometimes if you just have it on a piece of paper and someone claims that they wrote your song, um, you can't really prove that you wrote it on the piece of paper before they did, right? So um, what I recommend doing is going to www.copyright.gov um, and uh, uh, at copyright.gov you can actually register your copyrights with the Library of Congress or with the government. 
um, and, uh, and they can actually add additional protections to your work. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, but registering it with us doesn't, um, oh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it doesn't in, in, interfere at all with your copyright. Um, so the other feature I wanted to talk about kind of going back into, uh, registrations and BMI is, um, a service we offer called BMI live. Um, BMI Live is really cool because what we noticed is that um, people were going out and performing um, at like a venue or a coffee shop or, or or some sort of event, and the venue didn't really know what songs they were playing, and so we couldn't really get accurate data from certain live performance. So um, basically, our admin team created this BMI Live function, and if you are a member of BMI, you'll see it when you log in. Um, but basically, this allows you to tell us when you've played shows. Um, you'll give us all the information. Here's the venue. Um, and then you'll let us know uh, what songs you performed. And you can save it as a set list if you're doing the same set list at multiple shows. And this kind of just gives us a little bit of extra data. That way we're able to pay more accurately. Um, so if you say that you played a show and that is a BMI licensed venue where we've, we've gotten a license fee from them, um, we'll pay you your piece of the pie based on the songs that you report to us that you played at that show. So it's a really cool thing. Um, definitely, if you're playing shows and you're a BMI member, check that out. Um, uh, and then lastly, um, uh, you know, because you have an option of which performance rights organization um, to sign up to in the U.S., you know, because there's those other ones that I spoke about, um, we're always trying to offer kind of extra creative services to help our members um, and kind of stand out from the crowd a little bit. Um, obviously, uh, events like this, you know, we're always trying to kind of help educate um, but, but there's also some creative opportunities. So, um, we, you know, have, uh, this acoustic lounge showcase. Um, we have it in multiple cities like, uh, LA and New York, um, where we have, uh, writers kind of performing songs. Um, typically in Los Angeles, we do it at Hotel Cafe. Um, and in New York, I believe it's at Rockwood. Um, and we normally, when it's not COVID, we do this every month, um, to give people an opportunity to kind of share their music. Um, we normally have these BMI 101 courses, which this is kind of like a BMI 101 light. Uh, this is, this is like BMI 100.5. Uh, and it basically just tells you what, what, you know, BMI does and goes into a little bit of specifics there. We've moved them online. So I actually hosted one like a couple weeks ago and we're going to be doing them every month. So for the next one, um, anyone can, can sign up. It's like a, a webinar on, online. Um, and so I highly recommend going to the BMI calendar to check out the next date there. Um, we also have, um, some really cool performance, uh, opportunities in addition to that. So every year we program an entire stage every day of Lollapalooza. Um, and it's a pretty cool stage. It's always like really cool, like, um, artists on the rise. Um, uh, we've had a bunch of huge people play it kind of before they, they became as famous as they are. Um, uh, we also do the same, uh, type of booking of a stage at, um, Austin city limits. Um, we have multiple events at South by Southwest every year. We do a stage at hangout fest in Alabama. Um, so we have some really cool live performance opportunities. Um, normally, obviously this year is a little bit different, but we're hoping that, um, when this pandemic blows over, we'll be able to continue all of those things. Um, we have a bunch of playlists on Spotify. So, if you email us releases that you have, we'll try to throw it on our Spotify playlist. I'll, I'll always forward for consideration. Um, we have uh, some really cool, um, uh, you know, uh, BMI jam sessions that we started um, kind of during COVID to allow people to kind of post uh, videos of them playing. Um, and, and you can see a lot of those on our YouTube page. Um, and uh, we also have a BMI resource guide that we put out during COVID, which basically um, it provides songwriters and publishers a comprehensive list of where to go for aid, um, during this time. Um, so, uh, let's see, I see we have some, some comments here. Uh, we're going to have to get a beat of the week artist on one of those. Absolutely. Hey, um, I hear you. So, um, if, uh, if you do want to email, um, your local office for any of these, um, just email, um, uh, you, you can find all the information at our con contact section of the BMI website, but, um, if you're in Los Angeles, you can, or, Local, you can um, email Los Angeles at BMI.com. Uh, we also have offices in New York, Nashville, Atlanta, Austin. You know, it's New York at BMI.com, Nashville at BMI.com, et cetera. So you can always go and check out um, those contacts and just email your local office, and then they should be able to help from there. Um, uh, and then uh, I, think, I think that's basically, I've 
I've just spoken for like a really long time. Uh, so um, maybe I'll open it up to questions now. Um, Cause I think we've been going for like 30 minutes now. Um, so I'll open it up to questions and maybe we'll do like 10 minutes of questions or something like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, let me know in the chat uh, what you guys think. I hope this has been like helpful for everybody. Uh, I know that some of these, these concepts are, are really hard to understand and um, you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion out there. So um, I always try to, to help people out because I, you know, I want everybody to, to collect all the money that they're owed, you know? Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's see. Do we have any questions? I know that that was a lot. If you have questions later too, you can always email your local office too. If things come up, we're always, um, happy to help. Um, so, oh, here we go. Um, when we only own half the song, for instance, I'm a songwriter, but I lease the beat from a producer. How do we sign up? Um, for the song for BMI correctly. Okay, so um, so here we go. Basically, um, when people say that they're leasing a beat, um, the problem is is that I don't like um, I don't know really what that means, right? Um, as I said before, you have the master and you have the composition. So before you release anything, it's imperative to kind of talk about okay, who owns the composition and what percentage does everybody own? And who owns the master and what percentage does everybody own? And that's something that you should discuss kind of with everybody before you release something. Um, so when you say you're, you're leasing a beat, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're, um, you're paying them, uh, you know, some upfront fee and then they're relinquishing all of their rights. And so you're going to own all of the composition and all of the master, or does that mean that they're still going to own the composition and the master? Um, and you're saying according to the contract, it's 50, 50, that's fine. Well then in that case, just verify with them, say, okay, they're going to own 50% of the songwriting and 50% of the publishing. You're going to own 50% of the songwriting, 50% of the publishing. And also you want to talk about what percentage of the master each of you own. That's kind of the important part because the composition and the master are the two things that are generating you money going forward. So super important to figure out when you're releasing music, who owns each of those and what percentage and get it in writing. Make, make sure it's very clear. Um, that way, as money starts to be generated, and come in, you know who it's supposed to go to. Um, and then I see I got stuck at the 200% split. 200% split, um, this, this is specifically with BMI and with registering works with us when you're, when you're telling us what songs you've released. So um, basically, as I said before, we, we pay songwriters and we pay publishers and we kind of split all the royalties 50-50 between us. So our total ownership percentage is 200% because we have 100% for songwriters and 100% for publishers. So um, basically, you just want to make sure that after you add all the songwriters and publishers, the total percentage at the end is going to be 200. Now, if I, let's say I um, wrote a song with my friend, and neither of us have publishing accounts, but we want to split it 50-50. Well, technically, I would be owed 50% of the songwriting and 50% of the publishing. They would be owed 50% of the songwriting, 50% of the publishing. But we don't, neither of us have publishing accounts. So what we can do is we can leave the publishing section blank because we don't have publishing accounts. Only publishing accounts can go in that section. Instead, in the songwriting section, we're going to list 100% going to me and 100% going to my friend. And what that 100% actually is, is 50% writing, 50% publishing, but we're just routing it all through the writer accounts. So that's kind of how that works. So as long as the total equals 200 at the end, um, you should be okay. Um, okay, so let's let's see what else we got here. Um, do you automatically collect your royalties when you use a third-party service like DistroKid or TuneCore, um, or do you have to sign up to BMI in addition? Very good question. So um, basically, uh, there's lots of different types of royalties out there. Most distribution companies like TuneCore or DistroKid, these are the companies that actually get your music up on the platforms. Most of them are just paying royalties for the master. Um, some of these companies have uh, pro services or upgraded services. Like I know TuneCore offers it. I know CD Baby offers it. I don't think that TuneCore does right now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. These upgraded services um, basically add publishing administration. So if you're signing up for a publishing administration service as well, they will actually register your music with BMI or ASCAP on your behalf. 
Um, and they'll also be a distribution company. So they're trying to be all in one. And they're trying to kind of collect all, all your royalties as kind of like a one-stop shop. So um, it's important to see if they offer publishing administration to verify to see if you've signed up for it or not. Um, regardless, you still need to sign up with a performance rights organization. So you would still need to sign up with BMI or ASCAP regardless. Um, it's just that if you sign up to one of these other publishing administration companies, they're going to register the songs for you. So you're not going to have to register the songs. I hope that made sense. Uh, I know that some of this stuff gets crazy, um, but hopefully that you guys are able to follow that. Um, anything else? Got about four minutes or so. BMI has upfront costs to sign up or collect payment through royalties. Um, so BMI um, songwriter accounts are totally free. So if you're signing up for a songwriter account, you're not going to have to pay BMI any money. We will collect your royalties for free. Um, if you're setting up a publishing account, there is a fee. It's a one-time fee to set it up. Um, if you're setting it up under um, your social security number, like as a sole proprietor, it's $150. Bucks. Um, if you're setting it up under like a company, like if you have an LLC or a partnership or a corporation, like an EIN, um, it's a one-time $250 fee. Um, but there's no like fees for registering songs or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> how is Sound Exchange different from BMI and ASCAP? We always get que asked questions about Sound Exchange. So Sound Exchange pays. It's almost like performance royalties, like what BMI and ASCAP pay, um, but it's for the master. So it may pay artists and labels, whereas BMI and ASCAP are paying for the songs. So we're paying songwriters and publishers. So that's the difference. So um, you should, if you're in the U.S., you should absolutely sign up for Sound Exchange um, because uh, it was basically um, uh, created by the government, um, and uh, they helped pay a royalty that you're really not going to be able to collect um, otherwise. So I highly recommend if you own the, the sound recording um, or you're the artist, um, sign up for Sound Exchange because that's a whole different royalty stream, um, and it doesn't conflict with BMI or ASCAP at all. You should you should be signing up to everybody. So I'll, I'll wait just for another minute or so just to see. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's been it's been a pleasure, guys. I hope I hope you were all able to get something out of this. Um, uh, so we'll wait just to see if any other questions come through. Um, but um, this has been cool. It's my first uh, Twitch stream. Uh, it's been very uh, very fun. Um, I'm gonna have to do this more. Um, Oh, here we go. Trey has another one. Um, oh, thank you, Natalie. What's the typical breakdown for producers, writers, and performers? Um, oh, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, so I'll answer this one last question, and then, and then I'll, I'll log off here. So um, really, typical breakdowns, I mean, it's really up to you guys. There's no rules. Um, it's, uh, keep in mind, though, performers, unless they wrote the song, they won't get anything from BMI or ASCAP, right? because we're only paying people who wrote the song or people who own the song. So if you just perform someone else's song, you wouldn't be included in BMI. You'd get other types of royalties. Um, but, you know, for writers and producers and anybody who's writing a song, anybody who owns the song that they, they wrote, um, that's up to all of you. So once you write it, you'll have a discussion. And sometimes it's everybody dividing everything evenly. Sometimes it's more complex than someone's like, you only wrote one word or something. Um, but that's all up to you guys to figure out. Um, so, um, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you all so much. Um, sounds like, uh, you guys have got, got something out of this hopefully. So thank you so much for tuning in and have a great rest of your, your week and your day. And, uh, I am logging off. So, uh, bye everybody.